Hello, everyone, and welcome to this editor series broadcast on overcoming commercialization challenges for cell therapies and gene therapies. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Biopharm International and Pharmaceutical Technology, and I'll be moderating today's event along with my colleague, Feliza Mirasol, who is science editor of our publications. While cell therapies and gene therapies offer great promise as treatments and cures, challenges associated with developing, manufacturing, and delivering the drug product to patients remain. In today's session, a panel of experts from contract development and manufacturing organizations will provide analysis and perspectives on some of the hurdles associated with development and commercialization. This is the first of a two-part series on challenges associated with these emerging therapies. The second part, cell and gene therapies laying the foundation for a new supply chain, is scheduled for Wednesday, July 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can register via the link in the resources section of your viewer. This webcast is presented by Biopharm International and Pharmaceutical Technology in conjunction with Interfex. Interfex is the premier pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and device development and manufacturing event to experience science through commercialization, through exhibits, networking, and conferences, to leverage quality, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. Interfex will take place April 20th to the 22nd, 2021, in New York. I have a few important announcements before we begin. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or you can hover your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and drag the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, just click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Please note, resources provided by our sponsor can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about those sponsors. Providing clean rooms and critically controlled environments has always been AES's sole focus. With over 35 years of experience, the company has witnessed the changes in regulations as well as the challenges that their clients face in getting their products to market faster and more efficiently. Catalan is a global leader in providing integrated services, superior drug delivery technologies, and manufacturing solutions to help life science innovators develop and launch successful pharmaceuticals, biologics, and consumer health products. Catalan has built an advanced range of technologies and capabilities and is dedicated to enabling a better and faster customer journey from product development to patient. At Catalan, employees share a common goal to put patients first and help people around the world live better and healthier lives. Eppendorf is a leading life science company that develops and sells instruments, consumables, and services for liquid, sample, and cell handling in laboratories worldwide. By exploiting the strong synergies in bioreactor technology and polymer manufacturing, Eppendorf has emerged as a global player and valuable resource to its customers in the bioprocess marketplace. Eppendorf was founded in Hamburg, Germany in 1945 and has more than 3,000 employees worldwide. The company also has subsidiaries in 25 countries and is represented in all other markets by distributors. Once again, thank you to our sponsors and learn more about them in the resources section of your viewer. Now I'd like to welcome today's speakers. On our panel, we have Alan Moore, who is Chief Strategy Officer for the Discovery Labs, Christopher Murphy, who is Vice President and General Manager, Viral Vector Services for Thermo Fisher Scientific Pharma Services Group, and Thomas Van Cott, who is Global Head of Product Development, Cell and Gene Therapy for Catalan. So to provide a foundation for the discussion, we've invited each speaker to introduce themselves and their company. In addition, we're asking him to give a brief introduction on the state of cell therapy and gene therapy development and how well the biopharma industry has been doing to date with meeting some of these challenges. Then we're going to move on to an objective discussion on challenges and strategies to address these issues. So with that, 
I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk about himself, to talk about Catalint a little bit, and then to talk about the state of the industry. Tom? Well, thank you very much, Rita. It's great to be here. It's great to be with my colleagues, Alan and Chris. I'm looking forward to uh, a very interesting session here. Um, so I'm Tom Van Cott. I'm the Global Head Product Development for Catalan Cell and Gene Therapy. I think you heard in the intro a lot of things that Catalan does, but, you know, more recently we've been very much heavily into biologics and cell and gene therapy manufacturing. And so as part of the cell and gene therapy group, we, we are an integrated cell and gene therapy CDMO. So the services that we're offering are everything from research and clinical-grade plasmids, which are, of course, critical raw materials uh, to be used to produce the cell therapies and viral vectors. Um, so we'll also do the viral vector manufacturing, the AEVs, adenos, lentiviral vectors, and also cell therapy uh, manufacturing, you know, autologous, allogeneic. We have sites in the U.S. and we have sites in Europe. So what is this current state of cell and gene therapy? I would say it's still early, but it's been effective. I mean, there are products that have advanced uh, for commercial applications with potential curative diseases. So in that way, very effective and very successful. You know, with respect to um, diversity, you know, within the, the gene therapy field, we've been able to adapt to multiple viral vectors, multiple manufacturing platforms, adherent cultures, suspension cultures, been able to work with multiple serotypes, which helps to target different cells and tissues, reducing doses for both systemic and local administration, and also with cell therapies that are being able to produce autologous, allogeneic, uh, CAR T cells, NK cells, macrophage, TCRs, and, and stem cells. So those are successes. Those are success stories. But, however, we really need ways to increase production. We need to increase production, simplify the process. We need to produce better yields. These products are still very expensive, and they're expensive to produce. Um, they're very complicated manufacturing processes. Uh, they require very expensive raw materials. So we need to develop better ways to increase yields and also to improve, and to improve some of the viral vectors and increase the uh, payload capacity, um, allow for repeated dosing, you know, via less immunogenic capsids. We need to be able to produce more optimal uh, uh, AEV vectors, for example, that have more full capsids. We need better cell lines, producer cell lines. And really importantly, we need, need better analytics. We need better ways to characterize the products that we're making to make sure that we're able to down-select those that are most potent and most safe. And with respect to cell therapy production, we really need to work more with closed systems that will allow enhanced flexibility and scale. So, so overall, I mean, if you think about this as very early in the process, there are a lot of success stories, a lot of platforms, a lot of diversity with respect to um, products that can be manufactured, but we have a ways to go to make these production platforms uh, less complicated and certainly less expensive to produce. So with that, I'll pass it over to Chris or Alan. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Rita, I'll take it back. We're going to move on to Alan now, and we'll jump into all these topics that they're bringing up a little more as we progress. Thanks. Alan? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Moore. Uh, I'm joining the uh, Discovery Labs in August as uh, Chief Strategy Officer. I've been in the uh, contract services uh, space my entire career, roughly uh, 40 years, uh, and I'm excited to be uh, joining Discovery Labs and helping to stand up uh, the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. The Center for Breakthrough Medicines is designed to provide for all of the different resources that are required to move a advanced therapy from clinical to commercial success. Uh, the company is located at the former GSK World Headquarters uh, in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. It's basically a one million square foot campus of 14 buildings supplied with a central utility plant uh, and redundant uh, systems. 
the Center for Breakthrough Medicines is going to occupy roughly 600,000 square feet uh, and has uh, expansion potential on a 200-acre site uh, to receive up to 4 million square feet. The uh, services that are contemplated for the Center for Breakthrough Medicines is uh, uh, spanning the spectrum from plasmid DNA manufacturing uh, through vector manufacturing and cell processing, as well as all of the process development and analytical support that's required to uh, enable a coordinated uh, and managed uh, progression of uh, an advanced therapy from uh, early stage to commercial. Um, you know, commenting on the industry, and it's, it's difficult to, to add to what Tom had, had covered because I think he hit all of the uh, all of the uh, issues that uh, we're, we're seeing right now, and what I kind of describe as a, an industry in its adolescence. Uh, the industry itself uh, reminds me of the early days of uh, monoclonal antibody production, uh, and if you think back, the uh, concept of producing. Uh, a therapeutic for human use in mouse societies is, is kind of scary, but the early stage uh, processes for monoclonal antibodies were, were clunky, uh, kind of uh, gangly and untenable. Uh, the reality was that uh, there was recognition of the value of those products long term, and uh, the industry uh, and the uh, the folks that were providing the equipment, the supplies, the tools uh, uh, matured in parallel. And uh, one of the keys uh, was the development of analytics that allowed for understanding the process of manufacture and also understanding the product. Uh, and today, the uh, challenge that I see facing uh, the cell and gene therapy industry is the rapid development of both the tools and the platforms and processes uh, that allow for efficient manufacture, as well as the analytical tools that would allow us to uh, identify uh, improvements in, in the production of these products. I think it's also fair to say that uh, the uh, uh, industry, uh, the tool providers are catching up to the opportunity, and we can anticipate uh, much more progress. And an example would be enhanced downstream purification for viral vector. Uh, right now, if you show the, uh, the yield of a viral vector process to someone who's accustomed to manufacturing recombinant proteins or monoclonal antibodies, they're really horrified by the low yields that we're, what we're seeing that we're dealing with right now. But uh, much progress, much promise, and uh, a great deal to look forward to. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, Chris, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So I'll touch on uh, these uh, these questions here, which are I think uh, Alan and, uh, and Tom have both covered really nicely. But just as a quick way of introduction, so I'm Chris Murphy. I've been in the industry now, I'm happy to say, over 30 years. And uh, interestingly, I've been in gene therapy now. This will be sort of my fourth decade in that I was in there in the 90s, the 2000s, uh, the last decade, whatever they call it, and then, of course, now the 20s. And I worked for Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I came into Thermo Fisher Scientific through Brammer Bio, which was acquired by Thermo Fisher uh, Scientific last year. Uh, I was chief operations officer there, and I'm extremely proud to be part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, which really is the world leader in serving science, with a mission to really enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer, and 75,000 employees, 5,000 scientists, uh, and really a unique value proposition, which we're actually leveraging really heavily right now in this COVID crisis. So really proud about the work we're doing in support of uh, finding cures and testing for uh, COVID-19. Uh, as far as uh, Pharma Services Group, which is a pay formerly Patheon with a mix of a few other businesses, you know, we are really an end-to-end -end, uh, group within Thermo Fisher. Or, you know, we're serving uh, anywhere from distribution and clinical trial support uh, commercial self finish and the like. And the key for us is an integrated offering that can simplify the development and the supply chain. Power Vector Services, of course, which was formerly Brammer, has grown enormously with the industry over the last few years. And we started in Florida about 14 years ago as Florida Biologics. And over the last few years, we've grown enormously both in Cambridge, where we're, we expected our first product license there at our Cambridge facility, 
Uh, our Lexi facility is now online, and we expect to have a license there late next year. And then, of course, we just announced a new facility in Plainville, Mass., which is just south of uh, Boston, which is about 300,000 square feet. So really, by 2022, we'd expect to have over 30 drug substance suites plus fill finish capabilities to support the industry. And it's just as far as just the way I frame um, where the industry's at and, and the areas of challenge that exist, there's no shortage of drivers in this industry, in this market. There's over 700 new gene therapies in development. There's been five molecules approved. We'd expect this summer to see BioMarin's uh, hemophilia A product approved. Uh, really great support from the regulatory environment. Of course, uh, tons of investment. I think the challenge, I think, is uh, both Tom and Alan have already touched on, is really the maturity of the technologies. And, you know, when I go back to the 90s and see the processes we were doing then, they're not that different today to make vector. And I think that's a key element for us as far as how do we really make this scalable. So I'd say we're back in the early 90s as far as where monoclonals might have been in the early 90s is kind of where I'd say the technology is today. And, of course, capacity is – there's a shortage of that. There's a workforce that really does need to be trained to be different uh, to support these technologies, whether it's the testing side or on the uh, – the analytics, sorry, the uh, manufacturing, and of course, there's a very complex supply chain, which I think, uh, again, Tom and Alan have already touched on. And really, the patients are counting on us to solve these issues, both from a cost perspective, but also to make these medicines more available to people who need them, whether it's for late-stage cancer or for rare disease. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris and Tom and Alan, for the introduction. Now we're going to turn to the actual Q&A, the editors have put together some questions, and I'm going to turn it over to Felisa Mirazol to start the first questions. Thank you, Rita, and thanks to our speakers for joining us for this panel. Now, let's kick off with our first question, which is, what technical challenges pose obstacles to cell therapies as they move from clinical to commercial phases? And why don't we let Tom uh, start off? Sure. Thanks very much. Um, well, there are many technical challenges here for the cell therapies that go from clinical to commercial. Again, you know, it's still in its uh, young days, adolescent days, as um, Alan or Chris uh, alluded to. But, let, you know, but if you think about it, if you think about the process to produce a cell therapy, I mean, it is actually quite complicated. I mean, there are multiple sequential steps, you know, from uh, preparing the sample to washing to selecting the right phenotype, to activation, to the transduction step, to expansion, to harvest, to formulating the product. And, you know, in the clinical steps, these are often done open uh, steps, you know, a high amount of labor and a high uh, possibility for contamination. Um, so when we think about scaling this to commercial, you know, one of the things that we really need to be thinking about is, how do we try to simplify and automate the process and to um, go from open systems to more closed systems? And I think, you know, if we can go to these more automated closed systems, you know, we can look at things like reducing our labor costs, reducing the probability for contamination due to some of the open processing. And I think, yeah, and, and so that, that's going to be a big challenge is really scaling these up into, into, into commercial. But we also need to look at the analytics. And again, as, as complex as the, the manufacturing process can be, so are these assays. And to be able to optimize and validate assays, especially, you know, when we're looking at some of these potency assays and some of the phenotyping assays, this is, this is a challenge for the field. And I think we also, and we alluded to it, but the supply chain. I mean, and when we think about the supply chain for cell therapeutic, you know, this often also involves a viral vector, most likely a lengthy viral vector. And the coordination of the GMP manufacturing of your lengthy viral vector um, to coordinate that with the cell therapy manufacturer is quite a logistical challenge and also expensive. And then often your lengthy viral vector were, will involve plasma DNA for the trans and transfection to produce the lengthy viral vector. So you're talking about a very 
complicated supply chain, an expensive supply chain that needs to be controlled and coordinated uh, in order to all be uh, ready for your cell therapeutic um, to be manufactured. Alan, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think there are some other uh, challenges with uh, commercializing, you know, for instance, an autologous product. Uh, one of those is dealing with the kind of inherent variability of the starting material. And, you know, there are ways to try and alleviate that to some extent, uh, providing kits, uh, established processes, training at the sites uh, where the tissue or the, uh, the cells are collected. Um, but also uh, making sure that you have the you know vein to vein logistics uh, uh, established um, and coordinate that with your manufacturing schedule. Uh, you know maintaining the chain of custody, maintaining the chain of identity, uh, and also being able to come up with a, a, an effective uh, manufacturing uh, and distribution uh, network. Um, you know, there's the potential for distributed or centralized uh, manufacturing of the products, and, and uh, you know, that can provide some challenges in terms of demonstrating comparability. Another issue that uh, is, uh, is challenging if you think about commercialization of the product, um, often there are, uh, you know, uh, very little materials available uh, to conduct the studies to establish robust processes. Uh, in some cases, you can't use normal human donor uh, cells in lieu of the uh, disease state cells. Um, and, you know, so autologous uh, pr products are, are certainly challenging. Uh, allogeneic products as well can have uh, challenges. And if you think about the complexity of producing uh, an IPSC-derived uh, product where there's uh, uh, a, um, a cell that is driven to a, uh, an end state uh, and represents a, a mixed population of cells, characterization of that product in terms of potency uh, is is quite challenging. Um, and I think Tom uh, mentioned the you know complex supply chain and coordination there. Uh, that does become uh, very, very challenging, and uh, coordinating the analytics and quality control for the lease, release of the product uh, provides some challenges as well. Thank you both for those really insightful comments. Let's move on to our next question, and that is, what is the current status of viral vector manufacturing capacity, and related to that, will existing or planned capacity meet the market needs? Uh, now, why don't we go ahead and have uh, Chris start this time, and then we can move on to Alan and then Tom. So, Chris, why don't you go ahead and get us started on this question? Thank you, Feliza, and, uh, and it's great to hear from my colleagues as well on the panel. Um, I think, in short, if you just look at the, uh, the success these medicines are having with patients in need, and then you look at the number of products, as I uh, illustrated on my intro slide, that are in development, we're clearly in a state of uh, there's not sufficient capacity. There's really two reasons for that. One is that the uh, facilities that were used for more for common proteins and monoclonals really aren't suited to do uh, viral vectors simply because there's a BL2 requirement typically and there's airflows and certain unique elements or you know, bespoke elements of making vectors. I think the other is just... The volumes needed, as I think Alan had touched on, about the, the yield uh, being pretty low uh, means you need an awful lot of capacity just to make enough to, to meet the, the, the patient population. So I think it's I think it's growing, and certainly there's a lot of investment. Uh, certainly Discovery Labs, as well as Catalan and First Thermo Fisher are investing heavily in this area. But uh, if you look at the trajectory of a market that could be $17 billion by the end of the decade, uh, there's going to be a need for more. Um, and if we, and there was a recent article uh, published on this, and I can't recall specifics, so I won't uh, quote it, but just to say in general, I think the analysis I'm seeing is that it's really not going to be enough as this, uh, as this, in the indications grow, and particularly as gene therapy moves to treating more, uh, commodity type in indications like things that aren't rare disease. If we're going to see that, we're going to really have to drive up capacity as well. So, but I think there's not enough now, and there probably isn't enough planned yet for the future. Great. Alan, why don't you go ahead and take a crack at this? 
Yeah, thanks. I certainly agree. I, I've seen estimates that um, right now we're we're looking at uh, you know a, a capacity shortfall of, of five times what is needed, and in, in five years it's going to be fifty times underserved. Um, now that assumes uh, success, but I think we're beginning to see the uh, early success with uh, indications that require kind of massive doses of, of vector. Um, BioBarin comes to mind, and uh, uh, Robert Boffy has commented that he believes he can see something like 10,000 doses from from their California uh, factory, and that's. That's um, uh, certainly uh, a great start, uh, but but for that indication, they're going to need a lot more vector. Um, so I, I think we we are going to uh, continue to to need to build out and to uh, focus on uh, improving uh, the yield per fo- square foot, if you will. Um, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, there's there's going to be progress there uh, to to some extent. The field was, uh, you know, ignored for more than a decade because there was considerable doubt as to uh, what the long-term uh, future was for for uh, gene therapy and certainly uh, uh, for cell therapy limited investment. So uh, now that folks are focused on uh, making products that are going to serve a very very large industry, I think we'll see progress. Great. And Tom, why don't you go ahead and round us out? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think my my colleague uh, stated it very well, but, you know, we have spent and others have spent a lot of time kind of looking at this market. And it it really is, it is pretty remarkable. If you just take a snapshot of all products in, say, preclinical development, then you add some, you know, success rates that we're seeing so far in the market. And um, you just use average doses for systemic versus localized routes, you know, you do get to some pretty staggering volume rates. Now, if you then look at, you know, the the supply that's out there and you do take into account uh, the new growth, just as uh, Chris had alluded to, there is a lot of investment in additional capacity. And if you even take which all of us are striving for is better efficiency, you know, higher yields, which do happen, which is happening continuously. You know, when you throw all those numbers kind of together, it still comes out to be um, that the demand will outstrip the supply. So, you know, I think, you know, a couple of things can happen. I think we'll, we will see more capacity, but I think it really does drive the need for all of us you know, all of the companies out there to continue to invest in processes that can enhance and increase the yields that we're getting and the, and the quality of the products, because it's it obviously it's essential that we meet uh, the demands going forward. But, you know, this is a, it's a challenge. Certainly it's a challenge for all of us that are in the field. And um, obviously we're going to strive to still be able to meet the demand. Now let's take a look at some of the manufacturing challenges. What can cell therapy and gene therapy manufacturers learn from the commercial manufacture of monoclonal antibodies and vice versa? What can MAB manufacturers learn from the cell therapy and gene therapy manufacturing? Um, Chris, why don't you go ahead and give us your insights on this one? Sure. Thank you, Felisa. You know, I think the key thing that really started to differentiate uh, the growth in commercial manufacturing of monoclonals was a real heavy investment in engineering. And when I look at the technology, and I think Alan said it well, that, you know, for years, and when I started in the 90s, it was a very R&D-focused uh, industry in developing these processes and great scientists working on it, no doubt, but really not a heavy investment, I think, on the engineering elements of scaling up and improving yields, which went heavily into commercial manufacturer monoclonals. And I think there's something to be said about that kind of investment in that expertise to drive up yields versus sort of what I call a more classical empirical approach where we're trying different ratios of plasmids and, and transient um uh, processes, for example. So I think there's something to be learned on the investment there that I, I think we're, you know, we certainly are investing there. And I know uh, many other companies are now starting to invest heavily on the engineering side, process engineering side. 
And I think on what uh, manufacturers might learn is a couple things. I think one is we're advancing some pretty nifty analytics uh, to support the, the testing and release of these uh, gene therapy viral vector molecules. And also on cell therapy, there's some great rapid testing going on for sterility assurance, things like that. You know, in addition, I think because it's a very single-use technology heavy industry, I think there will be things we learn uh, in making vectors and scaling up single-use technology that I think could be applicable to uh, monoclonal and recombinant protein manufacturers. Thank you, Chris. Now, why don't we stick with you for a bit to go through the next question, which is, what MAB-based biomanufacturing techniques can be used for the scale-out of cell therapy manufacturing? And same question for the scale-up of gene therapy manufacturing. Yeah, I think on the cell therapy side, I, you know, if my colleagues want to chime in, they can, because I'm not as much of an expert on that. But what I would say that I see is it's going to be hard when you're talking about one patient, one product, right? So for autologous, um, however, I do think there's probably some testing and analytics that could be leveraged from those in that industry um, and possibly even some facility design features and things like that that we could leverage. I think for the scale-up of gene therapy manufacturing, I do think um, things such as, uh, as I just touched on the last question, you know, more of an engineering focus, the idea that, you know, these more formal mixing studies to ensure that you can understand the, the dynamics for um, a transfection event, those types of things, things that have been used for years now in, in the uh, monoclonal world, I think can be very applicable to help with the scale up of gene therapy manufacturing. The good news is, as well, we're already using scalable technologies to make vectors like chromatography. We're moving away from uh, ultrasound irrigation, things like that. There are more research tools. So I think we've already leveraged some of the technologies in this industry. Okay, our next question, still focusing on manufacturing challenges. In going from clinical to commercial phase, is there or will there be sufficient supply of the starting material? Um, now, why don't we go ahead and start off with Tom for this one? Sure, thanks. No, that's a really good question. You know, it's interesting. When you talk about viral vectors to start with, we actually have a similar supply demand issue for starting materials with respect to, say, plasmid DNA, which really is essential for both the cell therapy and the gene therapy product. So, you know, a similar kind of analysis shows that really the the, the demand in the plasma DNA technology is really um, increasing very rapidly and certainly exceeding what the supply is. And, and, and if you actually look at the timelines of a lot of the viral vector manufacturing, one of the biggest delays is due to the adequate source and supply of plasmid. So, so I would say certainly when we're talking about some raw materials, starting materials and viral vectors, we kind of have to start with uh, plasmid. Now, it is true that more companies, including ours, are investing in bringing this online, you know, for supply to all, but also to kind of integrate that with your own viral vector manufacturing process. So I think that'll alleviate it to some degree, but I think that's something that has to be um, considered. You know, I'm a little bit less knowledgeable in the field um, with the cell therapy as far as the allogeneic. And, you know, we have done some analysis and evaluation there. And, you know, this was a concern for ours, you know, with our new cell therapy CD email operations. So we did a, a kind of analysis in the field, but we did find that um, there were a lot of, uh, of, of companies that were entering the field for supply of allogeneic material. And so I think, you know, and I haven't done the forward-looking analysis yet, but at least for the present period of time, that seems to be um, uh, adequate supplies there. So, you know, I think, you know, for us, I would probably focus, like, at the beginning of this conversation, certainly with the, on the plasma area for now. Great. And uh, Alan, how about you? Sure. I think one of the things that we, we don't really know as yet uh, is the impact of, you know, the COVID-19 on normal, healthy donors. Uh, certainly the Red Cross is struggling uh, with their uh, donor pool. 
Um, but uh, as Tom said, I think there are a number of companies that have entered into the field. They recognize the need for provision of well uh, curated and, and tested uh, donor material. Uh, and you're even seeing uh, some of the regional blood centers uh, recognize uh, that they can play a role. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting there is that, um, uh, you know, those regional blood centers uh, can can potentially uh, provide some uh, benefit in terms of uh, reducing cost because they've long established uh, supply chains. They have uh, very uh, robust uh, methods for uh, trans, uh, transmitting uh, materials to the clinical sites, and they enjoy the uh, low cost uh, associated with their very high volume of consumables and, and materials. Um, so I think from a autologous uh, standpoint, there there should be uh, adequate materials to uh, uh, to support both the autologous and the allogeneic. And then, as Tom said, I, the uh, uh, plasmids at present uh, are, are challenging uh, in the in the development of uh, you know uh, viral vector based gene therapies. Uh, there is some some progress with uh, stable producer lines, which may help to reduce. Uh, the dependency uh, there and, and to provide a, um, a, a more consistent um, uh, production of a vector. There's been uh, commentary uh, in the field that sometimes uh, the plasmid um, uh, can be a source of uh, contaminants in the in the vector uh, production. So uh, there is a, there is progress being made, uh, and we believe that uh, there will be sufficient supply for these products going forward. Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, just briefly, I think the uh, panelists uh, really gave some great answers. I would just say, I, and I, again, I go back to something Alan said, you know, for years, folks were just toiling away, you know, the product they were making were new INDs and such, but really there, was, there wasn't really a sense that we commercialized these products. And, of course, a few years ago, that changed entirely with Luxterna and, and of course, Olgensma. And, and I guess, you know, what you're seeing is, of course, they were, we were a bit flat-footed on, on the material side. And certainly, uh, Aldevron did a great service for the industry by ramping up and being able to support uh, the industry. But I think that what you're going to see is a standardization of processes, which will make the supply chains a little less complex. Um, you know, whether that's going to be on transfection or maybe there'll be one or two winner processes. And I think that will help. You'll also see that they'll be catching up happening by suppliers. So I'm going beyond just the starting materials. I'm just thinking about single-use technology, things like that, that are that really were becoming a challenge for folks the last few years. Um, but they, I think the standardization on processing will help enormously, and, of course, then the yield improvements. I think that the interesting thing about COVID is you are seeing now some potential COVID uh, vaccines that are using viral vector production technologies effectively or, you know, adenoviruses, for example, to uh, deliver COVID. So it's going to be interesting that the impact you may see on the industry through COVID ramp up of production, you know, a billion doses for some of these uh, companies that are driving that technology. So it'll be very interesting to see if that creates a new uh, constraint in the business. Chris, that's a really interesting point. You're absolutely right. I mean, with COVID, and there are a number of recombinant viral vector technologies that are being used. And and we're seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing it, we're certainly seeing it, kind of conversion of some of the viral vector suite to be able to produce very rapidly um, the, the recombinant uh, viral COVID vaccine. So it's really interesting the way this industry has been able to be responsive uh, pr pretty immediately with all of the kind of platform platform and technologies that have been developed over the last decade or so. So anyway, I just thought that was an interesting point you made. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we are actually going to uh, bring it back to Alan with this particular question about strategies that can be employed to meet the limited turnaround time from apheresis to delivery of the cell therapy to the patient while still complying with GMP manufacturing. And I believe this is talking specifically for autologous cell therapy, although if it applies to allogeneic, please go ahead and let us know. 
Sure. Thanks, Felisa. Yeah, and and you know this is uh, one, one of the great challenges that you face with the autologous uh, therapies. I think one of, one of the things that's very important is to uh, look at the combined logistics along with manufacturing and um, establish you know that linkage with the logistics provider and your your CDMO um, in order to provide for that vein-to-vein control that's necessary for uh, collection, uh, manufacture, and release of the product back to the patient. Another area that's really important is um, the processes, establishing the processes and the policies and the controls and the QC paradigms that really support parallel patient uh, processing in the manufacturing suite. And this is uh, it, this is sometimes um, uh, difficult for folks uh, to uh, uh, embrace because uh, they're often uh, coming from the field where it was one product, uh, sometimes one product, one factory, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, multi-patient processing uh, is possible. There are products that have been licensed with that paradigm. Um, It's possible to use placards and temporal segregation uh, and really basing it on risk assessments and uh, making sure that you have the right uh, facility design in order to accomplish it. But it's important, uh, not not just for uh, the efficiency of of, uh, getting the product back to the patient and compliance, but also for driving down the the costs of manufacture. And and that is... um, uh, very much prevalent in the minds of the folks that are developing these products. Um, another another consideration is is really a holistic scheduling. Uh, it's it's important to make sure that the uh, logistics folks, the quality control folks that are doing your environmental monitoring, the an- analysts that are performing the in-process testing, uh, the quality assurance folks that are that are going to be reviewing the products uh, are appropriately scheduled. And more often than not, uh, there are uh, changes in schedule uh, of receipt of, of the patient material. Um, in in many cases in oncology, these patients are in, in a very bad bad way. Uh, they've failed multiple rounds of, uh, of frontline therapies. So it's important to have visibility into the clinical site and to have that uh, established coordination with your manufacturing team. Um, and then another component that's uh, that's important is the ability to review uh, batch records uh, in uh, in real time. Uh, you know, establishing modular uh, batch records that the QA uh, team can review, such that when you get to the end of the uh, process and and are preparing for interim release, there's a limited amount of time that's spent with quality assurance review, and you're really addressing uh, exceptions in in the batch record and and uh, communicating with uh, the client and the clinical representatives about the transport of the materials back to the site. So it is it is challenging, but uh, there are established uh, methods and approaches which can allow for good GMP compliance uh, while speeding the product along. That's great to hear, Alan. Thanks so much for that. And now we are going to pass the presentation back to Rita. Yeah, thank you so much to our panelists for the discussion thus far. Um, And some of the things Alan touched on, um, just a reminder, we do have a second part uh, to this series. It is going to talk more about supply chain, and you can find more about that in the resources tab. Now I'd like to invite the audience to participate in a poll question. You can make your selection on the screen and click Submit. So here's the question. What challenges is your company facing on the path to commercialization for your cell or gene therapy products? And you can select all that apply. So there are scientific or technical issues, finding development partners, financing future development, understanding the regulatory process, developing a manufacturing process, hiring or retaining knowledgeable workers, or finding knowledgeable contract service support. Again, the question, what challenges is your company facing on the path to commercialization, scientific or technical issues, finding development partners, financing future development, understanding the regulatory process, 
developing a manufacturing process, hiring or retaining knowledgeable workers, or finding a knowledgeable contract service support. So just make your selection and click Submit. And I thank you for participating, and the editors will be sharing this information online or in future articles. So let's turn now to look at some industry trends and challenges. We've touched a little bit on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on some manufacturing aspects. So let's talk about some regulatory issues that you may have observed. Are reviews being delayed? How are regulators responding? Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, so just real briefly, I think there's a couple of things that I've noticed. I mean, certainly one is because of the limitations on travel and in-person visits, you've had to shift to a virtual format for inspections, and we've supported that within our business. So I think that's becoming more normalized, but that's certainly been a change. You've seen some customers or innovators who've had to delay clinical studies because their trial centers had to slow down activity simply because of the hospital's focus on covid um, and as mentioned earlier, you know, there is now a push for some of our capacity potentially being leveraged to support uh, production of vaccines or filling of vaccines. And so that's, uh, that's now having an impact on our businesses as well. Great. Tom, do you have some comments on that? I mean, just a couple. I mean, obviously, you know, the, uh, us as a manufacturer, we're considered essential business, so we can continue operations. You know, obviously, we have to take all kinds of safety precautions to protect our employees and to protect the uh, the product. But, you know, the operations are ongoing. And, you know, with respect to even with the FDA and their and their inspections, I mean, I think this could be a um, kind of a new era. I mean, we, we were still able to have PAI inspections. They were done partially remotely and then on site. And there's just a new kind of format now. And and, and and who knows, it's going to end up even being a little bit more efficient moving forward. So, you know, from our perspective, things are continuing uh, to move forward on schedule. So that's been good news so far. All right. Let's then look at some more details in terms of actually getting the manufacturing done. So what are the benefits and challenges in commercial scale manufacturing of a cell therapy or, or gene therapy in-house versus outsourcing it? Um, Alan, I'm going to go to you first. Okay, thanks. Um, well, they're, they're, the regulatory authorities have created this accelerated pathway for uh, commercialization of these products because they're very, very much supportive of uh, these new life-saving and, and life-changing therapies. And that's kind of a double-edged sword because uh, it compresses the time that's necessary or that's available for uh, really developing and understanding and characterizing your, your process. Um, so that can can drain, uh, you know, a company that's looking to do the commercial manufacturing themselves. Uh, and also building infrastructure, uh, you know, for quality supply chain controls and all of the different functions that exist within a, a contract manufacturer uh, can be challenging. Uh, one of the benefits that's cited for uh, for um, uh, doing the manufacturing of the cell or gene therapy yourself is having control over the, the production. Um, but there's also uh, some concern because uh, you may not have a good understanding of the actual capacity requirements uh, that you need or what your market penetration is going to look like. So I think um, we're seeing folks recommend kind of a dual strategy where uh, you start uh, with a contract uh, manufacturer and uh, uh, look to have the capacity that uh, can be built uh, later on as you're more successful and more certain about the volume of materials that you need on an annual basis. Thanks. Uh, Tom, your thoughts? Sure, I agree with Alan. I mean, I think you are starting to see sort of a, a kind of a dual role. I mean, it's really important in-house to have that manufacturing expertise of your product, your platform, so that you can communicate and, and oversee the work done at the CDMO. Obviously, it's a huge investment to build capacity and in-house. You have to make sure it's not distractive to your overall kind of strategic mission. Uh, but we do see this dual purpose. And, and the other thing about that is that, especially with the gene therapies, there is that initial surge um, in, in production that you do need. And often that will 
um, exceed the capacity of any one site. So, and then of course that that um, demand will will lower to a, to an area that maybe one site could support. So, I think you do see a trend to having both in-house and outsource. I think it works well together, and it can also satisfy that initial surge in patient demand once a product is approved. Okay, Chris, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think it's been well stated by Tom and Alan. You know, to me, it's speed, capacity, and expertise, right? So, I mean, I think having capacity that's already ready to make these vectors or to do the cell therapy uh, passing and, and, and production, I think, is crucial because of the ramp up as discussed. I think probably the number one thing for me is expertise and people and the capability of people, which the touches you get in a CMO versus an innovator company on different technology, different analytics is, is really uh, differentiated. And I think that that's something that uh, customers, innovators need. And of course, uh, you know, they need the speed that it's, we're ready to go. We've got quality systems and the like. I, I think that the challenge, of course, is that you've got to have facilities that are exquisitely protecting against cross-contamination. You've got to have... Um, People that can do multiple manufacturing platforms, which is a challenge as well. Uh, and there's always a the control question, which I think Alan touched on. But uh, but overall, I think the expertise really relies heavily right now with CMOs because they've been doing it for years, uh, and and the innovators are certainly catching up. All right, thank you so much. So we're we're gonna wrap up now, and I'm gonna ask each panelist. What piece of advice can you offer to companies who are looking to commercialize cell therapies or gene therapies? Tom, you're up first. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, and Alan alluded to it, is this much more accelerated clinical development pathway. We no longer have the multiple years in phase one, phase two, phase three. We're going from phase one to pivotal, pivotal trials in phase three, and so people need to much earlier, define, you know, your quality target product profile, your critical quality attributes, your critical process parameters. Um, these really need to be, you know, be thought about very early, much earlier in the process and really start working heavily on, on your methods and finalizing the methods and begin validation because there's it always comes down to you're ready to go into your your PPQ and there's a lot of pre PPQ activities that that are are a little bit lagging behind so you need to start thinking about process characterization uh, much earlier than you would in a conventional biologic development pathway. All right, great, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Let's hear from you. Yeah, I think Tom said it well. I think. Uh, Clinical development is is it's completely reversed than what it used to be. CMC you had four or five years to develop your CMC, while clinical development went along at a certain pace. Now it's just the opposite. You have only a couple of years to get your CMC right, and uh, and the complexity of this technology cannot be underestimated. You know, you know, often there's comparisons for common proteins and monoclonals, but. You know, that's a producer cell line that's secreting a protein. This this requires not just a cell line that has to be characters, but also starting materials that need to come in contact with those cells at a certain frequency to ensure you can produce your product. So I think you really need to double down on the understanding of the complexity of the processes, select the process, and invest early in the, the CMC, as uh, Tom was touching on. All right. Thank you. Alan, we'll let you wrap it up. Well, it's hard to follow, follow Chris and Tom and have anything new. Um, I, I would say don't ignore some of the things that are uh, often shoved to the side, you know, peripheral uh, things, uh, you know, your supply chain, the logistics, the uh analytical uh, process for the analytical development uh, and um, another piece of advice would be uh, by all means uh, approach the regulators early they've created uh, uh, mechanisms to uh, uh, to provide advice and and direction and are very accepting of enhanced um, platforms uh, you know, there's a reluctance to some extent in the industry to uh, to communicate with the, the regulators for fear that uh, uh, something will set them back. Um, there are mechanisms within FDA, for instance, OCOD, where you can have a uh, scientific discussion and get 
expert advice that will be valuable in your uh, development process. So I would say I would encourage folks to, to do that even more so than in the biologics, the traditional biologic space, in the cell and gene therapy space. Uh, there's wonderful uh, uh, advice that can be had uh, for those who aren't shy. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alan, Tom, and Chris. Unfortunately, we're out of time. This was a great discussion. I'm sure we, we, we could have gone and gone on much longer, uh, but we want to thank you for the insight you provided. I want to thank the audience for attending and participating in today's event, and also thank to our sponsors, AES, Catalan, and Eppendorf for supporting today's webcast. Audience members, you'll receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and I invite you to forward that to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us. Don't forget the second part to the webcast, which will be on July 29th, and have a good day. Thank you.